Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for the latest episode of our Gleeble webinar series. My name is Dan Quigley with DSI. And on behalf of our whole team here, uh, we hope that you and your families and colleagues are all staying safe and healthy. Today's webinar will focus on how digital image correlation can enhance your Gleeble simulations. Our goal will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If you have questions, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. We have a few DSI experts online with us and uh, they can respond privately, uh, or if time allows, we do plan on having a short live Q&A at the end of the presentation. Video of this presentation will be available online soon. If you are listening to this live, you will also receive a certificate in your email later today. Uh, you'll be able to find a link to this video, as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website at gleeble.com, and then clicking on the resources link in the top navigation bar, and then click on webinars. There you can view past webinars and sign up for future webinars. Next week's session will focus on forging simulations with a focus on workpiece forming behavior and tool fatigue. So usually I have the easy job of introducing presenters and then I let them take over uh, and they present their research and findings. But today uh, they're making me do a little bit more work uh, than usual. So I'll go through our agenda briefly here today. Uh, I'll start today's webinar by presenting a handful of slides that give a general overview of how DIC can be used with a Gleeble. Uh, then David Jacon, or as many of you know him, Jake, uh, and Julius Walls will be here to help keep me on track, uh, keep me honest, and correct me if I say anything incorrect, uh, uh, but also answer any questions as they come up. Uh, we really see DIC as a, an exciting tool that will improve global testing. If there's a lot of potential here. You know, I don't want to be over dramatic and say this is going to change everything, but this this is, really is a powerful tool, and, and we do see this as, you know in the future being used a lot more. So. Uh, we're happy to, uh, to to make this presentation. Uh, we are experts on on the Gleeble. That that's what we know best. Uh, we are not experts on the intricacies of DIC. So uh, we are uh, happy to have with us today an expert, uh, Tim Schmidt from Trillion, and Trillion is a certified GOM partner uh, and expert. So we're happy to have him with us, and he'll then present uh, a little more detail into the the solutions uh, and options that you have uh, as they relate to Gleeble. Uh, so again, uh, we will have some Q&A at the end of, of the presentation, so please do uh, add, you know, if you have questions, add them right into the, the chat feature. Uh, we can answer some of them right away uh, through, you know, but our guys will type right back. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll do the live Q&A at the end. So I'll start with just a, a general, I think most people here, if you're on this webinar, you, you probably are at least familiar with digital image correlation. Uh, but just to give a, you know, a definition, uh, it's a full field, non-contact optical technique to measure contour, deformation, and strain. Uh, you can measure other things as well, but for us, uh, that's kind of what we're focused on. And this technology is really well suited for Gleeble simulations. Uh, it provides, if you look at, think about it, you know, a lot of times we use uh, you know, contact extensometers or you know, measuring between two points. And I think really the, the interesting piece here with digital image correlation is you can look at thousands of points and, and how they all interact. So. Uh, we're really happy to to work with Trillion. We have integrated DIC systems from a number of providers, but uh, I think most people here are familiar with GOM and the Aramis system, and, and Trillion's been a great partner. So again, happy to have Tim here uh, to help us uh, help us present this today. So, and, and many of you may have, may have already used a DIC system with a Gleeble, although you know, maybe you haven't, or maybe you have a system you've used DIC in the past, but we have uh, worked with Trillion uh, to develop custom connections uh, and software triggers so that it's a little, more of a seamless operation when you're using DSC. There's a lot of moving parts, obviously, and it is a complex system, but uh, we have worked with Trillion and, and the GOM software so, to make that, uh, that interaction much easier. Uh, we can integrate DIC systems with uh, both Series 3, uh, the older style Gleeble, the 3000 series Gleebles, as well as the new Gleeble Touch Controller GTC system. So that's exciting. And then we offer a number of uh, components that we, we need to kind of consider inside that inside the tank you know for example we need to rotate the jaw if you're looking at a flat specimen we can rotate the jaw to turn the specimen you know facing the cameras uh, and there's some things like that, that that we can we can do we won't go into too much detail here uh, but the, the fact is we've, we've been we've been testing this and we, we found kind of what works and what doesn't work so a lot of that work's been done already uh, and also obviously if you were to buy a DIC system from us or Trillion uh, that can be removed from the Gleebel uh, and used elsewhere in the lab uh, conversely, you, if you already have a DIC system, you can likely uh, integrate that with the Gleeble. Here's a couple of images. Uh, this is an example 
Uh, probably an older example. Uh, here we're using the, it's the high resolution cameras. Uh, in this case, we're using intense, uh, it's actually blue LED, it's not always blue, but in this case, we, we're using blue LED uh, to get uh, a better image. Uh, Tim will talk more about that as we look at high temperature testing, uh, which is really one of the specialties of the Gleeble. Uh, there are extra challenges, but we also have solutions for that uh, so that we, we can uh, see what's going on in the specimen even you know, at elevated temperatures. Uh, in this example, we're looking through the front of the tank. So those of you that have spent time in front of a Gleeble, you, you recognize this, uh, but you also can use the cameras uh, on the back, the back window of the Gleeble. And also this is a horizontal configuration. They can also uh, be vertical. We do have the challenge of looking through that window, but as you can see here, that window is nice and large. Uh, in this case, we have removed the safety shield. So uh, we you know, obviously you need to use caution when doing this. So uh, but we'll talk more about kind of how to integrate in a little bit. Looking at the, the basic anatomy of a DIC system, uh, this is just one example. Obviously, there's, there's much uh, more, more detailed uh, integrations and depending on what you're looking at. But for our purposes, uh, you, you have your cameras. You, typically, it's a stereo two camera setup. Uh, you have high intensity lighting. And again, there's depending on your test, uh, the specimen and temperatures, the, the lighting may change. Uh, in this case, we show a tripod, but there is a mounting stand and we've uh, work to develop uh, with drilling again, uh, a mounting stand that's specific to the Gleeble, which, which does uh, come in handy. Uh, and then a dedicated computer, uh, which allowed, obviously the, 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 this does require a lot of computing power. Uh, so there is a computer that's dedicated to this. Uh, and then integration with the Gleeble. So there is hardware and software, uh, which needs to be installed by a, a uh, system service engineer uh, at DSI. So um, it, it's just, it, it isn't a, uh, just simply buy this one package and everything is set up, but uh, we have worked to create kind of custom packages that will integrate with the Gleeble. Here's an image, it's an older image of uh, a system that was set up. You can see here the DIC, the cameras are uh, looking through the front window uh, and we have, I think you can all see my mouse, this is an arm. I think Tim will talk a little bit more about this later on, but this is a, an important piece. So this, this, whole, this whole rig can slide off uh, so you can act, you can open the front door and then slide the cameras back precisely into place so that uh, minimizes the need for calibration. Uh, so you know, moving cameras around is, is obviously a, a tricky thing to do, but we've, we've kind of solved that, that issue by using this arm that slides back and forth, which is quite handy. Again, a close-up of the same setup. You can see here, this is the cameras are in a vertical configuration uh, looking down on a specimen. Tim will talk more about this as well, but obviously if we're looking at strain across a specimen, we, we may need to, to uh, spe we call it speckling uh, the, the, the sample. So here's some early examples uh, of tests we've done from just a tensile specimen uh, and a couple of uh, tests kind of during, uh, during tension here. So uh, these, aren't, these aren't animated, uh, but you can see how that, uh, the, the surface is moving uh, and you know, during the test, and obviously the cameras are picking up all of that movement. And this is a, a very high test, the one on the right. This is actually above our spec. We don't spec it to go this high. This is 1300C. Uh, the elevated temperatures, you do start getting some washout, but uh, this test was somewhat successful, but you know, we're always careful not to over spec our equipment. So uh, I think our engineers are probably looking at this and not happy that I put this in there, but this is something that uh, I think we, we can start seeing uh, high performance at elevated temperatures. And uh, as Tim will talk about later, I, I believe you know, we, we've, we've spent a lot of time optimizing the system to be able to operate at these high temperatures. So what types of, of tests do we run? I mean, there's a lot of different types of, of tests that you can run using a DIC. Obviously the round bar specimen, I just showed a couple, there's tensile test, heat treating. Uh, you can do SECO tests, which our Gleeble users know that they're looking at strain-induced cracking, crack, cracking a, you know, on a round specimen. Flat specimen samples, we can do a tensile tests, strip annealing tests. Again, you may need to rotate the specimen uh, to face the cameras. Uh, uniaxial compression or uh, uniaxial compression is uh, or flow stress specimens. That round specimen, again, you can zoom right in on that. Uh, take a look at the, the the strain across that specimen. But one of the other things you can do is, is a lot of flexibility. So you'll see some tests in, in coming up in a little bit where they're they're non-standard specimens, and sometimes it's hard to get an extensometer to clip on to a small hot zone or you don't want to interact with the specimen physically, you want to do non-contact. And that's really where DIC is powerful, looking at some of these you know, ways you don't know how to measure something, you don't want to measure jaw to jaw, you don't want to you know, be able to clip on 
uh, you know, a, a large extensometer, this is really a, a unique unique tool for us. So uh, this is what, you know, one of the things we're really excited about is, is working with customers on their, their custom tests. So again, you know, key features, as I just mentioned, non-contact measurement, uh, no mechanical interaction with the sample, uh, and you also don't need to you know, as, be as precise with placement. Once it's calibrated and you can get in there, you can make make some of those changes, you know, in the software, looking at the you know, the interface on the computer, uh, and looking at these complex shapes and geometries. I think we do have some images coming up where you can see test uh, some some unique types of tests uh, that we just couldn't do with contact measurement. Uh, and then Tim will get into this maybe in a little bit, but looking at some of the, the flexibility we have to so looking at different parameters uh, in the DIC and in the actual software, uh, there's a lot of, you know, and this is where it's nice having a, a DIC expert on the, on the call today. There's a lot of options that you can do that are just, uh, you kind of, the, you know, the, the, the goal is to have this thing easy to work, you know, out of, out of the box, but there are, you can really dive in and look at a lot of those settings and change those things uh, and, and kind of be an advanced user and look at some additional features. So uh, one of the questions you get, people say, well, okay, well, how much does it cost or which one do I get? Uh, it really isn't a simple answer. Uh, it does depend on a number of things. One is the sample geometry, you know, what type of uh, specimen are you looking at? Uh, where do you want, you know, do you want to go for the front, front window, the back window, uh, what, what, te what's the, what the temperatures we're looking at, how big is the sample specimen, uh, and then deformation speeds. Some of these things are uh, easier to fix or easier to deal with than others. You know, the maximum test temperature, we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, because as you get into those really high temperatures, you do get some washouts, so we do need to address that, uh, and there's some options for doing that. Uh, but once we can kind of get a sense for all of these things, then we can start to, to work with uh, Tim and his team to find the right solution uh, for you know, your type of testing, temperatures, and materials. So here is another schematic of the, you know, on the right we have the cameras in action, uh, but on the left you can see, and this is, is not to scale, obviously, for, for our Equipment. But you can kind of see some of the things that we need to, to look at uh, when you're looking at you know, kind of making sure that you're in focus and looking at the right, uh, everything is optimized for the, the right uh, the right setup. So a lot of times DIC is used uh, to look at you know, airplanes or car doors or these different uh, large things. We're, we're in a much different uh, kind of business where we're, we're looking at a, very, a small specimen. Uh, we want to be really you know, close to that specimen, uh, high resolution, high speed. So again, uh, working with an expert, we can find the, the right setup to make sure it's all optimized for what, for what you care about. Here we have a, a couple of quick videos. So this is a uh, uniaxial compression, or, or we call flow stress test. Uh, you can see strain, I hope the video is working. Uh, and you can see that the strain across that uh, the specimen. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we're looking at two regions here. Uh, depending on the, the, how the cameras are set up, we've seen some where you can look at a, a larger region uh, there's some reflection, there's some, there may be some issues, and this is, I believe this was at uh, 910 degrees. So I'll just play this again. You can see how that uh, strain is, is uh, happening across that specimen. And then on the right, ha right hand side, we have this is a flat test. Again, this is a uh, fairly standard test, but this is a uh, tension test with a flat specimen. So you can see that strain, it starts to localize in the center, and we can see how that is. Uh, this, is, this has been slowed down a little bit, so you can see uh, how that strain is changing across that specimen. So here we have, this is a unique uh, test uh, specimen. We don't, uh, it's, it's been done before, but this is, uh, we don't do it often. Uh, but you can see here the, the, the ends here, this was covered with a, a blue tape, so we were able to speckle uh, the, you know, the area of interest on the specimen. We still do uh, want to have clean ends, so we we'll sometimes we'll, we'll tape off the ends so that uh, the speckling doesn't get everywhere. Uh, we can see a couple of different tests here, and now we'll have a video of strain as you know, this was being pulled in tension. Now this is also being heated, I believe, through induction. So this was a, a case where we had, uh, and Julius Walls was on the call here. I uh, did a lot of work on this. This is a, uh, a test specimen that's been heated with induction. So we've got the induction unit coming in from the back. They did develop some custom. Uh, induction coils uh, to heat this from one side so that we're able to get the camera uh, to be able to view the specimen. So I'll play this here. And this, they're really interested in the strain in that, that small section there. So this is an example where it'd be very difficult to, to put a clip-on extensometer and accurately measure 
that small region in the middle of the specimen. Starting again. There we go. Okay. So again, this was uh, just a little more detail. You can see uh, this similar specimen on the right-hand side here. We had that induction coil. We did experiment with a number of different uh, coil geometries. I believe this was the final one. Uh, so we're heating it from one side, and then also being able to see the the specimen uh, with, with the cameras uh, is important. And then you can see on the left-hand side here we have this the arm that I referenced earlier. Uh, so that we can slide the whole camera and lighting rig off to the side, open up the front door, access the specimen, uh, but then slide the cameras and lighting the whole rig back exactly into place uh, to uh, reduce the number of times we you know, need to calibrate. And uh, again, this is an example, you know, the, the lighting, and this is a, a calibration uh, option here. So this has been simplified for us. Obviously, we, we put the, the calibration, so this is a calibration field. I don't know if Tim's going to talk too much about this, but the, the cameras will need to be calibrated, uh, and this is a, a little tool they use to do that. Uh, it's obviously, you can see it has a, a kind of a pattern on that, which helps and put that right in the location where the, the, the specimen will be. Uh, and again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, this, we call it a monopod, uh, with that a tracking arm is, is really useful to, to speed that whole process up. I mentioned earlier the, the, the jaw rotation. So if you see our standard configuration here, the specimen would be at an angle uh, that you don't want to the cameras, but we're able to rotate that uh, to 90 degrees so that the specimen is 90 degrees from the camera. Uh, and also there's some you have some things we we'll want to do also, uh, depending if you want to put the cameras on the back, we may need to change some vacuum hoses, but all those things are fairly well documented and we're able to do that uh, without too much difficulty. So at this point, I do want to hand this over to a, a true expert on this. I'm going to get, hand the reins over to Tim and ask Tim to share his screen. And yeah, thank you very much. So, Tim, I do appreciate you being here with us and, and uh, sharing your wisdom. So I, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Um, so the U.S. is a big country, but by good luck, I live in New York City. Gleeble is a two-hour drive from me, so if I'm bored in the morning, I can drive up, have lunch with the guys, and then we can do some good work together in the afternoon. And it's been my privilege to have been doing that for the past few years, and um, it's been a great experience. But that's what I want to talk about now is how we've been working together, combining our expertise in order to optimize the solutions we can give to you to enhance your uh, testing. So I want to give a very short overview of myself and, and Trillian and Gohm, who makes the, the basic Aramis system, talk a little bit about my prior high temperature experiences before Gleevil that prepared me for uh, the challenges. How did we evolve Aramis together over the last couple of years in particular? You may have um, special interest in material property measurements. We do have a module for that in Aramis. I'll give you some details about that. Uh, some of you may have heard of or done 2D DIC. I want to talk about the, the limits of 2D and why we normally do 3D. And then in 3D, what are the most common configurations that we have available and which ones uh, might make sense for you depending on things like your strain rates and uh, need for local strains. Those were some really, really beautiful local strains that Julius had measured on that last test that they were showing. Um, you are all around the world. We do have a very strong international support network. Um, support is equally, if not more important than the quality of the product. So we definitely pride ourselves on our support and our ability to give you support no matter where you are in the world. I think we will leave time for some live Q&A as well. So just a few words about me. That's me standing uh, on the space shuttle launch pad. That was a career highlight. But basically, this is the only thing I know how to do. I've been doing full field measurements since I was 14. I do work days, nights, and weekends. I come from an R&D and product development background. Um, I've had the honor of being principal investigator on a Air Force project to 
develop the ability to do Aramis at very high strain rates on the Hopkinson bar. I was one of the first four fellows elected uh, into IDIX, which is the International DIC Society. In fact, our conference is next week. So if you have any real strong interest in, in DIC, there is the virtual IDIX conference next week. We can send you uh, links to that if you're not aware of it, and you can learn a lot more. And then um, I didn't even know as a civilian I was eligible, but I actually was given um, the astronaut's personal award for quickly figuring out how to do DIC on the space shuttle external tank on the launch pad. But for today, the real question I have is how can I help you with your everyday work? Um, so yeah, about IDEX and about something Dan mentioned, on the one hand, yes, there are, the power of DIC is that there are different knobs you can turn after a test. And I have a whole four, four to five hour course that I teach for IDIX called DIC user variables and data optimization. So I can tell you anything you need to know about that. On the other hand though, uh, you'll see when I start talking about GOM and the GOM philosophy, we try to make it, all of this just preset in the background so your results will just pop out without you needing to know all of these deep details of DIC. Um, just to show other kinds of activities that I've gotten involved in and Trillian has gotten involved in, there are various emerging um, standards for the use of DIC. This was a presentation I gave to a working group uh, last year about calibration of DIC and, and just current trends and, and good practices for the highly expanding use of DIC. So just some, some typical discussion topics that we get into, the, the whole 2D versus 3D uh, trends, um, verification and certification is a very important topic to us. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention, I'm actually chairman of the IDIX training and certification committee. So we provide independent certification of users uh, through practical and written exams. And again, this is important. You need to trust DIC as an instrument if you're gonna use it. So the simple description of Trillian is that we're the exclusive GOM North America Aramis distributor. We've sold and supported lots of systems over 1,250, uh, but we, typically take the lead on, on special application development. Um, Glebal is an example of that. Uh, we also do a lot of services. In fact, we've done more than 12.5 million in services and we don't get paid to try to make special measurements. We get paid to make special measurements. So having to do all the services makes us very, very good at being able to walk into a situation and, and figure out how to make it work. Um, GOM literally translates to Company for Optical Measurements. I have a few more uh, slides about GOM. Uh, the key points are uh, down below in red here. So GOM is, is quite a large company growing really rapidly. There's more than 500 employees just in Germany now, of which 50 are programmers. This is really a key point. DIC is the work is primarily getting done in the software, although we think we also have some nice uh, unique features in our hardware. Uh, there are more than 5,000 Aramis systems. Uh, GOM was recently purchased by Zeiss, so now they're an even bigger company. But what they really pride themselves on is being an industrial system provider, and they're definitely trying to be the best, not the cheapest, uh, but you're also gonna see we do have a wide range of price performance points, so regardless of your budget, I feel certain we can provide you with a good solution. And, and again, I'll give you lots of details. So they do have a broad international network of distributors. Uh, there's about 35 around the world um, and Trillian has good relationships. And I'll talk more about that at the end and give you some details and examples. So lots of customers around the world. Um, this list goes on and on and on in every industry and every type of application. Um, GOM is broader than uh, other typical DIC providers. They have a much wider range of products. Their best known product is actually their ATOS digitizer. And a lot of the features they needed for that get put into the Aramis system. 
uh, to help us be able to do some very, very nice work. Trillian is also growing uh, rapidly. So we now own our own uh, building. Uh, that's the front view of it at night. Um, uh, we have to take a new picture because this one's outdated, but yeah, we're up to about 24 people. Most of us are engineers. Um, so there's always someone available. In fact, we do have a dedicated uh, support person available at all times by phone or email. Uh, they tend to work during normal business hours. And uh, if you're working 10 p.m. on a Saturday for some reason and something comes up, I have definitely answered cell phone calls uh, at that time and stopped what I was doing just to help out. This is very important to us to be available uh, for you anytime with whatever questions you might have. Um, I've got some slides here from a high temperature seminar that I had developed by request, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but just to give you some awareness of what happens with high temperature measurements. Uh, so first of all, everyone might have a different concept of what is high temperature, uh, what are the potential problems and solutions that we've developed, and then some uh, measurement examples. I'll show some from what we did for years before Gleeble. I did my first high temperature measurement in 2002 uh, for Corning, and we actually were measuring uh, CTE at 1200 degrees uh, Celsius all the way back then. Um, made some mistakes the first time I did it, but now we've got it figured out. So what is high temperature? Everyone would agree the definition of room temperature or ambient some folks like electronics guys for them 120 or 260 degrees c are common temperatures that they go up to uh, 1200 degrees c is a kind of for welding um, type temperatures and that's a very very common glee ball temperature i'm going to show you an example of measurement i made uh, with glee ball at 1200 c um, we do have folks that are going much hotter than that so um, we do a lot of work with NASA. In fact, I'm in Huntsville right now and we'll be proceeding into NASA Marshall right after this webinar, but we do have folks interested in re-entry type temperatures. So going up you know, more into the 2000 degree C range. So these are possible to do as well. Um, yeah, it is tougher to measure at high temperature than at room temperature. So noise will increase. Um, uh, the good news there though, is the main source of noise is um, is hot air moving and with the direct resistance heating um, or with the induction heating, uh, that's easier to deal with than um, convection uh, measurements or, or other uh, types of uh, heat sources. So because it's the thermal currents that cause time varying distortions and we actually don't get that much of it in a glee ball, which is great. Um, of course, the patterning needs to fundamentally survive and not melt. Um, radiant glow is uh, probably the single biggest uh, potential hurdle to being able to measure at these higher temperatures. And I'm going to talk about what we've learned to do to fight the radiant glow uh, with lighting and filtering and, and things like that. Um, in general, the way to fight noise in any DIC measurement is averaging. So if we normally like to take pictures at 25 milliseconds exposure at high temperature, we might purposely do 250 to 750 milliseconds or longer. Of course, we can't do that on a more dynamic test. We do whatever we can. Um, if convection currents are, are an error source, we can use fans inside the chamber or between the chamber and the cameras. Um, again, we haven't actually needed to do that with the glee bowls, which is great. Uh, we also can do oversampling when when the strain rate allows. If we simply take 10 or 25 or more pictures at each um, desired data point, we can then uh, do averaging of the data to denoise it. Um, but again, we actually haven't had um, um, a need to do a lot of that. And it's more necessary to do these things in a convection oven at a few hundred degrees C than it is in a glee ball at 1200 degrees C. So the radiant glow is our dominant uh, potential hurdle. The simplest thing you can do is uh, use just very, very bright lights that are brighter than the radiant glow. 
um, with IR blocking filters. Um, it also helps to then change over to monochromatic light. That's been a trend in DIC to move away from white light to monochromatic light. If you have a blue light and blue filters, you're helping to filter out the radiant glow. Um, there are some trends now to take that further and do ultraviolet lighting and patterning. I don't have it on this slide, but the ultimate solution when needed uh, is laser illumination with a narrow band filter. And that would help with the even higher temperature measurements um, if these other approaches were not sufficient. This is one of my uh, early uh, nice measurements at high temperature. So they were welding on the back of this plate and I was doing a DIC on the front of it. Um, the uh, very first uh, high temperature paint was simply aluminum oxide uh, dissolved. Um, I used water as the solvent. Um, Isopropyl alcohol would have been better, but they didn't let me change because it was working. Um, we did that test early in the morning, so we, we used a coffee cup, but the, the use of coffee in the patterning solution is optional. It's not uh, required. And then uh, they didn't tell their intern uh, that she was going to be working in a welding factory, uh, but you don't have to dress up in order to uh, be able to do this. The a typically dressed engineer on the right also was able to apply the high temperature pattern. Uh, this is just showing the survival of the pattern. Aluminum oxide definitely works up to 1300 or 1400 degrees C. You're seeing here the heat affected zone and no discoloration or, or loss of the pattern at all. So it, it was not very difficult to get started doing high temperature. Uh, this is a movie. Uh, this is the subset. I just to make the movie go faster. This is every fifth or tenth frame, um, but you're just seeing the strains uh, built up um, as the robot welder passed across the back, and now as it's cooling, the strains are decreasing. I want to mention a bonus capability we have in DIC. We can do these very dynamic measurements. As a bonus, we can do um, residual strain or plastic strain measurements. So here we went back the next day and, and took a new post-test reading of that part, compared the single pre-test to the single post-test data points. So that's a map of the plastic strain that was left in the specimen from before to after, in this case, the welding process. And it's quite interesting if you have a look from the pulsing of the power supply, there's high strain, low strain, high strain, low strain, high strain, low strain, high strain. It was not a uniform um, result, uh, but that's what we're seeing. And of course, that's the general power of DIC is to get these very local strains. It's as if we've painted on 5,000 or so strain rosettes and displacement gauges. Uh, just some other quick examples. This was done of, as you can see, with the induction heating up to similar kind of temperature range uh, and, and getting the local strains for the purpose of FEA validation. Uh, this is a, a NASA application. They had desire to measure deformations and strains uh, during uh, rocket hot fire tests. This is a subscale development test. This is only about a six inch diameter uh, nozzle. Uh, it just lit and you're now seeing some, some smoke appearing, but oh, there goes the strain gauge very, very, very early in the test. So it is very, very difficult, as you probably already know, to do this with any kind of conventional instrument at high temperature. Now you're seeing the, the very strong radiant glow just in the raw camera image here. Uh, but this is why, uh, among other reasons, it's really necessary to do DIC. You, you don't have many other ways to uh, get data. Um, so they, NASA did their own uh, development process for the high temperature patterning. Uh, you're seeing here just one slide from a whole big presentation they made where they're looking at, um, for them, they had extra challenges of adhesion due to the vibrations during their testing, uh, but looking for, is it maintaining contrast and then the material compatibility? And I'll talk more about that in a moment when we look at how we develop the patterning together with Glebel. Uh, but there, 
desire was to be able to do DIC in this very, very, very challenging environment. And they did succeed in doing that. That over on the right is a stereo pair of high speed cameras, in fact. Uh, so they're measuring uh, at higher frame rates during this quite, quite dynamic and challenging test. So we did have a pretty good background when we walked in the door of Glebo uh, that we were pretty comfortable that we would be able to work together and get results. So this was one test that uh, I did together and we're logging the temperature. So you're seeing here the temperature. Uh, we didn't quite get to 1200 on this test, but pretty close. This is 1168. And what you're seeing is very complete uh, data coverage, no dropouts, very, very nice, clean data. Uh, you've seen some uh, similar pictures from Dan, just to talk a little bit more about this. So this did require some customization. That's what Trillian loves to do. That's what keeps my job interesting. Here, the lighting was some very, very high power uh, fiber delivered lights just to be able to get the lights aimed through uh, what, we, what remained available of the window opening. Um, and, you know, if you're looking uh, at a round specimen, it gets a little bit more challenging. There's a potential for uh, specular reflection causing dropouts in the data. So the, the lighting is definitely a very important part of the system and getting enough light delivered into the test chamber um, takes some iterations and we were able to get that done. This was an iteration of it. Um, this is our 3D camera style sensor that I'll talk a little bit more about later, but we're having a very, very high power um, LED light delivered through another window rather than using the fibers. Uh, the, the blue tape is sold separately. Uh, of course, that's a joke. This was just a development test and then Glebo went and uh, you know custom made mounts for the optimized lights to be delivered through their windows. Um, the patterning went through some really interesting iterations. This was a um, this is a beautiful pattern of just the aluminum oxide on the bare metal. And because of the imaging modality, uh, those white dots just appear brighter to the cameras than the uh, bare metal. And you have a, a, a sufficiently contrasting pattern uh, to get great data. Um, this was the uh, one of many arts and crafts sessions that we had at Gleeball, just figuring out together, okay, what's a fast, easy, repeatable way to get a pattern applied on a round specimen. This was a rolling technique on using the texture of the felt of a stamp pad, uh, but very quick repeatable delivery method. So Trillian then developed a kit that could be delivered together with the Gleeble machine. Um, again, the, the goal being fast, easy, repeatable patterning. Um, this was a, another more major development session. I took a snapshot just to show what, what's going on behind the scenes at Glebel to uh, improve performance. So round specimens, looking at different angles, going to higher temperatures uh, did demand uh, improved patterning. So we had the Glebel chemist actually advising us about interactions and what are allowable and not allowable materials. And that led to success. So now we have a black high temperature background coating with the white dots, and that helps suppress the radiant glow. And then Glebel themselves came up with a, a fast, easy way to deliver that optimum pattern. Now, you may have interest in material property determination. That's the strength of the GOM system. This is one of their general. Um, uh, marketing materials showing the 3D camera looking at very local strains at room temperature in a tensile test showing all the local strains. But um, they do have, a, as I mentioned, a special tensile test evaluation module. So, and by the way, high strains are no problem. Um, 10 to 30 percent, which is common in a Glebal, depending on your material, is awesome. Higher is fine. Lower is okay. We do lots of work on specimens that may have a 2000 micro strain, uh, peak strain. So we're, we're good in terms of pretty much any um, strain range. Um, and, and I have to say, honestly, I, I've got these examples of local strain. 
Uh, you're seeing here local strains on a composite. One of my new favorite local strain examples is the result that Julius obtained uh, with Aramis. I really uh, had to resist unmuting myself and saying how, how great I thought that very, very local result was. Uh, there was just a few millimeters width on that region that he was showing the local strain. Uh, this would be an example, on the other hand, of getting the bulk material property. And here what we're doing is things like linear fits in the elastic range during a test. And um, all of these types of results do pop out of the Aramis software a minute or two after the test. Um, I'm just hitting you with some highlights here to make you aware of it. We do have uh, recorded uh, webinars about that. We also have to to simplify the use of Aramis, we have what we call a kiosk mode uh, that makes a really, really simple user interface. So a technician who is used to just running a load frame or running the Gleeble itself, it, I call this taking the DIC out of DIC. Um, it just guides the user and it automates everything in the background. There is a webinar about that. I know some of you would be blocked from accessing YouTube. We can just send you this uh, recorded video on request and then GOM has lots of manuals showing uh, the user interface and all of the math that goes into how exactly they measure material properties. Uh, these formulas and scripts are open source so they could be modified if you have a special type of test that you run in a special way you want to calculate things, we can actually um, edit these for you at no cost to get you what you need. Um, I think I have enough time to cover everything I wanted. I'll go for another maybe seven or eight minutes, hopefully, and leave time for questions. But just to convey to you some other important details on what's available, the system on the left is a, is a, your your pretty typical DIC system. It's what we call an adjustable base system on a tripod. It's very flexible. The camera separation can be changed and realigned. So it covers a wide range of sizes. Um, on the other hand, the, the type of solution that GOM has that's more unique and, and more industrial and, and easier to use is what we call the 3D camera. And then the 3D camera on what we call the studio stand. That's more of a high-end solution, and we don't we don't necessarily see other DIC providers going down this direction. But this is the GOM approach of industrializing DIC. Um, so, a quick note about 2D DIC before I talk more about the 3D uh, configuration choices. Um, so the issue with 2D is uh, there are major error sources for 2D. Uh, any out-of-plane motion causes error. Well, you get out-of-plane motion just from the Poisson effect. The specimen is moving away from the camera where it necks. Yes, it's possible to fight that with a telecentric lens, uh, but still non-normal viewing causes significant errors. And well, you know, the windows on your chamber may not be position so that you can look exactly normal at the specimen. Of course, it doesn't work on a round specimen. So just to, to cover the topic very quickly, this is why we do sell 2D systems. Uh, but generally speaking, we, we definitely recommend 3D if, if what you're looking for is high quality data that you can be certain uh, that, you know, we, we claim a strain resolution uh, in the order of 25 microstrain, at least at room temperature, and it doesn't get that much worse in, in the glee bowl at high temperature. Uh, but if we look at um, errors in 2D, just to, again, quickly hit the highlights, there's a full webinar from GOM available on 2D versus 3D. Ask us for it and we'll send it to you. But just to show very, very quickly here um, what can happen, you can get a couple of thousand microstrain error in a heartbeat um, just from lens distortions or angle changes in when you're doing 2D DIC. Um, and again, with the tilting, you can get uh, the, the formulas and stuff aren't quite appearing in the right order, but uh, you can get even a higher error just very, very quickly. So these are things that some people doing DIC may not be fully aware of. So we have a whole 
webinar just about that to explain why, yeah, we could sell you a much cheaper 2D system, well, but how, how important is the quality of your data? If it's really important, we're going to recommend 3D. So within 3D, we've got basically three categories of solutions would be a good way to describe it. At the high end, we have fast 12 megapixel cameras uh, available in either 75 or 335 frames per second, and they do go up to 1,000 frames per second, still with very good resolution. So for higher strain rate work, that would be the probable solution that we would recommend. We have 12 megapixel cameras that are our standard, most commonly sold configuration. They're doing 25 frames a second at full resolution, and they can go 50 in binning mode, which basically halves the resolution. And then more recently, uh, we've developed what we call Trillion Snap, which is a, a hybrid product. It's using a Trillion developed sensor and snapping software. So it's a flexible, lower cost solution. And a key point, it works with nearly any cameras. Um, we can connect any cameras to the Trillion Snap software. Uh, of course, there is a price you pay for that. There's less integration and ease of use, and there's no real-time measurement capability. Uh, but it's, it's definitely good enough for folks with limited budget. And key point is using the full power analysis and reporting uh, module in, in the GOM software. So you're not giving up anything on, on that side of it. And in fact, this is what Julius used uh, at Gleeble to get the results that you were just looking at that Dan was showing. So um, we provide a lot more information to you on a case-by-case -case basis, but this is the, the snapshot of the three most common uh, types of configurations that are available. Uh, we're always looking at what else do you want. We've heard of the desire for uh, full field temperature measurements to go along with the full field um, strain and displacement measurements. So uh, IR camera integration um, is a, a hot topic, uh, pun intended. So we're not only going to be providing with that the full field temperature measurement, but in the Aramis software, uh, we do have the ability to take the uh, difference in temperature for every data point. Uh, if we know the CTE of the material, we can subtract the thermal strains and leave only the mechanical strains. So we're, there's a lot that we're looking to do with IR cameras. I do have some prior experience. I think I do have time um, to go through it very quickly, but we were uh, requested by the U.S. Air Force um, quite some years ago now to look at the aft deck of the B-2 bomber um, because of a, a cracking issue that was occurring. This was the feasibility uh, trial uh, using DIC. They were using an engine start cart to simulate uh, engine wash over a titanium plate and which was instrumented with lots of thermal couples and so forth. But this was just a another early example of a higher temperature measurement and the type of feasibility that we do. This was the a pretty complex field test, right? A lot of you may only, only think of straightforward laboratory environments for DIC, but we, my specialty and the fun of my job has been uh, we do lots of work out in the field like this and, and figure out how to make DIC work, uh, not at all in a lab. So that's the DIC pattern that was applied to the uh, B2 aft deck. That's the custom large stereo pair up in the air looking down on the wing of the B2 while the engine was running. Uh, but this is one of the uh, full field uh, IR camera um, measurements that was made. Um, I don't have a lot more detail because we're going to run out of time here, but uh, Trillion has OEM relationships with FLIR, with Infratech, with Telops. These are three uh, popular IR camera makers. So what we plan to do, actually, just to finish showing the results, and then I've got a slide. Um, so here we were combining, as I said, the Aramis data with the IR camera data and then correcting the data. So um, I've been in discussion with Glebo, so we have uh, definite plans for me to make that 
short drive up and, and do some trials together in November 2020. So uh, more soon, but we, we know that's a topic of interest and we're working to address it. Uh, just to finish up the support, like I said, really, really important to us. There's no point in you buying a top of the line system and not knowing how to use its full power. So in the US, um, Gleeble and Trillian application engineers directly go on site to do the installation and the training. Uh, but in other countries, the local GOM distributor will provide on-site installation and training. That's part of what Trillian organizes for the DIC portion. And we're going to give at least two days of Aramis training and maybe three if you're going to be using Aramis for other purposes than the Gleeble. Um, and we we do this worldwide. We I would mention we do have especially strong working relationships with Korea uh, and China. Um, in fact, we already delivered to Global Aramis Systems to Korea, um, uh, so that's already been done. Um, China, I personally uh, until this year. Um, went to China pretty much every year. I've been directly supporting DOM 3D um, in Shanghai, uh, who is the local uh, GOM distributor. And yeah, there, there are perks to uh, traveling the world. I, this doesn't even look real, but this was uh, this bridge in Chengdu uh, that we got to look at. Eventually the water moved and we became convinced that we were really looking at this. And these are the gentlemen in China that would go uh, to support your global system. That's Roger Liu, head of DOM, and Darren, um, um, engineering manager. Um, so I, I, as I said, I, I go to China all the time, and here I was doing a training for a system. I think this one was in Chengdu. I think this one was somewhere else. So um, I may or may not go personally, but uh, DOM would be there in China. Uh, we are good friends with the India distributor, and we've already had success stories uh, in Korea, and, and that's important, and, and that's what we do. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time, and I think we, we do definitely have five or more minutes for questions and discussion, and I think Dan is going to take over, and uh, we can go through whatever other information you'd like to get from us today. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, interesting projects you've worked on. Uh, we do have a few questions. I want to thank um, Fulvio, uh, Jake, Julius, and Brian Allen. They have been answering some of them. I think some of them they answered publicly. Some just kind of responded directly to the question. So appreciate their help. Uh, a couple of questions that came up, and you actually may, may have answered them even during the presentation, but I thought we could just circle back and, and address them again. Uh, you, know, you and I both talked about this a little bit, and it's hard to put a specific number on it, but looking at maximum temperature. So simple question is, what is the maximum temperature that we can use with the DIC? Uh, it's a tough question to answer, but uh, Tim, do you mind just maybe taking a crack and, and discussing that a bit? Yeah, that's a very good question, a very important question. So obviously 1,200 can be done, has been done on the global. We, we showed examples of that. We do see, to be honest, that the radiant glow gets much worse from 1100 to 1200 to 1300. Um, but we haven't yet brought to bear the uh, other lighting techniques that I mentioned. So we, we were able to get to 1200 without a huge effort um, using sometimes just bright white lighting and some filtering. So I, I believe we could get up higher. Um, 13, 14, 1500 degrees C. We, as, as I showed in my slides, we know exactly what the challenge is. The, the, the main challenge is the, the brighter radiant glow. Um, I, I am going to be using the laser that I mentioned is the ultimate solution. We do have a OEM relationship with a, a laser illumination company. I'm using that laser for another purpose for a test in December. So I would say this, if if there's a definite requirement to go to uh, whatever the higher temperature is, we would simply do what we did in order to get to 1100 or 1200. I would go to Glebel. I would bring in the um, uh, other enhanced light sources and we would make trials until we get success and, and would be able to show a video of a test going up to 
whatever the temperature that is needed is. And I believe we'd be able to do that uh, just with uh, enhanced lighting. Yeah, and as you said, that's those are the things I think that keeps the job interesting. I know our team, uh, Julius and some other guys here at DSI did, you know, enjoyed working on that project because it was different and it was, it was unique stuff. So uh, thank you. Another question may be easier to answer, uh, talking about deformation rates. So the question is how fast of a deformation rate uh, can we use with the DIC? And I think that uh, you did, you know, some of your slides did, you know, address frame rates and uh, different options. And this is, I know there's an expression that money can't solve all your problems, but uh, is this an example where you can spend more to buy a better camera? Right. So we, we convert that question from what strain rate is possible to what camera frame rate is needed uh, for that frame rate. And you know, again, it depends on exactly what you're looking to do in the test. If you're looking for material properties, then the way we would describe that is that we'd like to get at least 20, if not 30 or more pictures in the elastic range so we can do all that linear fitting. Uh, if you're looking for you know, strain up to failure, again, you need a higher frame rate just to get as close as possible to determine what was the ultimate strength. So I mentioned the frame rates in the standard GOM integrated systems. They go up to 1,000 and, and also to 2,000 frames a second. There's no upper limit because uh, the GOM system works with external cameras, especially high-speed cameras, and there's a very wide range of price performance points on, on high-speed cameras, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 frames a second. We do that on a daily basis. That's the main thing I used to do with Aramis with high speed. Uh, we do use a camera that operates at 5 million frames a second and is fairly straightforward uh, to do Aramis with. So the Hopkinson bar test, typical strain rate is 1,000 to 1,250 strain per second. Test duration might be you know, 400 microseconds to 1 millisecond. Um, but there are cameras that can get you plenty of sample points uh, at very high strain rates. So that's an easier question. There's definitely no limit on the strain rate, and we've done measurements at very high strain rates. The higher temperatures, I'd say we we know we can do it, but we would have to do a little bit of development and proof work, and then then we'd be there. But high strain rate, definitely no problem at any strain rate. Great. So we have a few other questions that I think are pretty quick and easy, and I may even be able to answer them. Uh, but just, uh, I'd ask the team, uh, Jake, Julius, Tim, you know, chime in if, if I'm going down the wrong path here. But uh, one question was, can we integrate DIC cameras that we already own to our Gleeble system? I think uh, we did address that in the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, we can. We have done it. We've um, integrated uh, non-GOM, non-Aramis. You know, there are other ones out there. We have integrated those as well. If you do have a system already, as Tim, you mentioned, the Trillion Snap is really designed for this purpose. So uh, again, that's what we use at our facility. So uh, certainly the answer to that is yes, we can. Uh, another question says, what is the maximum size sample that I can use in DIC? So obviously you, you showed an example of the, the B2 bomber that obviously is uh, a large specimen if we look at that. So I'd say, I think the answer to that is if it fits, if you can test it in the Gleeble and you can view it through the window, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's not really a limitation of DIC, it's more a limitation of the Gleeble, what you can fit, the specimens you can fit in there, and then obviously being able to see it uh, is important, uh, and seeing it throughout the test and getting lighting in on there. So I think that's a dependent question on, on the specimen, uh, but it doesn't, I don't think it's a DIC limitation. Uh, is there a separate computer system for the DIC? Uh, there is, I think that's a standard, uh, and I don't know about the SNAP system, Tim. Uh, but in, in the standard Aramis or GOM systems, uh, I, I believe the computer is included. Uh, how about SNAP? Yeah, it's the same. So, um, you know, GOM particularly prides themselves on, on delivering very fully integrated standard tested systems, and they've then got support. So there's nothing do it yourself, uh, you know, especially on the GOM system. So they must supply the computer, they test the computer. Gome is actually one of the top five users of Dell computers in the world. They sell so many systems and have specialists just for support. But it is the same with Trillion Snap. There is a, um, a setup uh, process to get a 
arbitrary pair of cameras to work. So we want to do that for you and deliver to you a uh, fully tested, fully supported system. So we we don't want you to make your own DIC system. We want to deliver a, a fully tested and supported system, and that remains true uh, even with the Trillion Snap. Great. Uh, we're just uh, about out of time here, but I want to maybe ask a couple more questions. We had an interesting question. Uh, they asked, uh, is it possible to do nano indentation to create the patterns for DIC? Uh, and is this useful? I think there might be some challenges challenges that we wouldn't, you know, a gleeable specimen, we don't always want to have nano indentations uh, you know, along it uh, as it may cause some you know, cracks or uh, obviously some connection or a current path if we're doing it. We don't only want it in the gauge area, but has any, do you know of anybody that has modified the surface of a specimen uh, with nano indentation or some other method uh, instead of speckling? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, um, the, the best answer I can give is I teach another half a day course and it's called how to pattern dot 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 everything. Um, so there's a few golden rules of the DIC patterning that we didn't get into because of the time limits. Um, so the ideal DIC pattern, the features are three to five pixels each on the cameras. Uh, definitely want to avoid one to two pixel features. Three to five is ideal. And it's okay to be larger, you know, up to even 10 or 12 pixels. The second golden rule is with 50% coverage. So we want a mix of light and dark features to the cameras, and then also with high contrast. Uh, you can achieve that pattern any way you like. It's limited only by your imagination. So the question would simply become with a nano indenter is the, you know, why, why do it that way? But if there's a reason to do it, and if it can be done such that it meets the requirements of a good pattern, three to five pixel features with 50% coverage that looks high contrast on the cameras, you know, then the answer may be yes. Uh, usually that would be done only for, you know, um, uh, much smaller size ranges. Um, and that was a, a comment I was going to make. We talked about how large a specimen the opposite end is how small a specimen. So, I mean, I personally have done Aramis uh, in 2D uh, down to a hundred micron field of view. We've imported images from scanning electron microscopes and we, we've got ways to apply, you know, sub micron length scale patterns, but, but that's the real answer. I don't know why sure. nano okay. indenter might be desired but yeah if it meets the golden rules um and and is necessary for some reason then the answer you know would be yes it, it can be done great so we are about out of time tim I, I really appreciate you making this presentation taking the time to do it and i know it's a little bit earlier there as well uh there, there may be some more questions uh what we'll do is uh, maybe connect you with uh, the individuals making those questions i know that today you're you're headed into a facility where you probably can't answer uh, today, uh, but uh, certainly our team and, and we can work with you uh, to get answers to some of those questions if they do pop up. So, Oh yeah, this uh, this webinar was just a starting point. We would love to uh, talk to you all every day from now on uh, about the deeper details of how this works and, and uh, in particular, what, what do any of you individually need from the combination of Liebel and DIC? Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to continue this dialogue. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I think we'll wrap this up now. If anybody does have any questions for Tim or DSI, please do reach out to us. Every webinar, I do mention the new support portal that we have for customers. So uh, please do take advantage of that. That's on our website. I think it's go to resources and then go down to the customer support portal. You can create an account. Uh, it's a great way to get support from one of our service engineers. Uh, you can also search a knowledge base and create tickets. So please do do that. I take advantage of that. If you have any questions about how Gleeble can support your research, please reach out to me or anyone on our team and we'll make sure that we connect you with a, uh, the right regional expert to, to help you out. Uh, but thanks everyone for joining us. We really do appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, please do stay safe and healthy uh, in these uncertain times. Have a great day. Yep, thanks again, everyone.